Hi, my name is Bay Logan. Welcome to the DVD of City Hunter. And the Cantonese title of City Hunter is Sing Si Lip Yan. Sing Si meaning city and Lip Yan meaning hunter. And it's based on a famous Japanese manga or comic book by a writer artist called Tsukasa Hojo. And uh, it's kind of an unusual film for our star Jackie Chan because uh, even though he himself has often been called a live action animated character, this is the nearest he ever came to making a live action animated movie. And the character he's playing in the film is called, in Japanese, Ryu Seiba, and in Cantonese, Manbo. And he's kind of a, a Japanese take on uh, Magnum P.I. with a bit of the moonlighting vibe thrown in. He's a, a lecherous private detective with this female sidekick who's also in love with him and keeps him in line uh, when he's trying on his amorous antics by bashing him with a huge hammer. So this seems to be odd material, and it was chosen by Jackie's fans because he took a poll of his Japanese fans as to which character they'd like him to play, and apparently Manbo came out on top. So this became uh, a movie that uh, Jackie made in 1992. It was a Chinese New Year release, which is why the opening line he gives is a Kung Hei Fat Choi, Happy New Year. And there's Michael Wong, one of the studliest men in Hong Kong action cinema, and he has this brief cameo as Jackie's partner in fighting crime. And a little uh, reference there to the Batman TV series with all the slam-bang effects when they're fighting. And they kill Michael off early in the movie. Uh, regular fans of Hong Kong film will have seen Michael in a bunch of movies. Legacy of Rage with the late Brandon Lee, First Option, also with Jackie and Thunderbolt, and uh, in Choi Hark's knockoff opposite Van Damme, a role he inherited from Jet Li, which is kind of a shift in direction. So he gets to show his comic timing and talents here in the opening of the movie. He recently uh, directed his first film called Miles Apart. And uh, Michael's also now spends most of his time up in, the, up in the skies. He's trained as a helicopter pilot, and he's, I think, one of the five guys in uh, Hong Kong with their own helicopter to beat the traffic jams, which are kind of constant. Um, then the backstory to the character is that uh, the partner is killed off, and then Jackie inherits from him this young daughter. And we're meant to believe in the next dissolve that this young daughter transforms into the lovely Joey Wong, or Wong Jo Yi. And she's coming into frame in a moment. She's a Taiwanese actress and famous to fans of Hong Kong movies from the Chinese Ghost Story series and its many spin-offs. And uh, she was a very popular artist throughout the 80s and into the 90s until uh, she retired from the screen and then uh, married uh, a Taiwanese singer. And she just made a comeback movie with a director called Yun Fan, which is shot in Shanghai and uh, doesn't yet have a, an English name. And here we are in uh, Jackie's hangout in the movie, Man Boar's Lair. And this was actually years before we did it, but I always think that the place that he has as his base in the movie is reminiscent of the Jackie Chan stunt lab that we had in Jackie Chan, My Stunts, and is also reminiscent of an actual establishment he now has in a place called Fo Tan in Hong Kong, where he stores all of his vehicles and the props from his films. So I don't know whether the seed for these ideas was planted during the making of this film, but certainly the Man Boar Hangout is a, is a lot like uh, Jackie's Chan Cave, you know, Batman has the Bat Cave, and it's very dark, and Jackie has the Chan Cave, and it's, it's very bright. At this time this film was made, uh, Hong Kong movies were not shot in sync sound, so even the voice of Jackie on the Cantonese print is not actually Jackie Chan's own voice. It's actually a voiceover artiste. But if you can hear the song now, the Cantonese song that he's singing, the City Hunter theme, that actually is Jackie's voice singing the title track. But in the movie itself, it's just some anonymous dubbing guy. Uh, this movie came about because Jackie had spent about a year shooting a movie called Operation Condor and realized that he needed to raise his um, rate of production if he was going to maintain his position as like the king of Asian action. So he started cooperating with a number of uh, successfully established Hong Kong directors. And this movie he made with a gentleman named Wong Jing, who's a prolific populist director uh, specializing in his own street level wacky brand of comedy he started his career at Shaw Brothers his father Wong Tin Lam was a famous director and the mentor of many famous subsequently famous Hong Kong filmmakers like Ringo Lam Johnny To Benny Chan uh, and Wong Jing himself has made a huge number of films both as a producer and a director and he's occasionally made a uh, classy affair like God of Gamblers with Chai and Fat or the special effects film Storm Riders. But he's better known for kind of cheap gags and, and a kind of... He's like the Roger Corman of Hong Kong. He's somebody who takes a genre and kind of just shoots films for, like, minimal budget with maximum return. 
And I know that Jackie himself felt at the end of uh, 1992 that the experiment of working with other directors ha hadn't been that successful. But the films he did during that period each have uh, a lot to recommend them. I mean, he was shooting this film back-to-back -back with another film called Crime Story, directed by Kirk Wong. And I can't really think of two more totally opposite films. One is as bright as the other is dark, and one is, as, is just fun, and the other one is quite seriously dramatic. Here we are, an interior shot uh, in Hong Kong, and uh, we're about to see the secretary of uh, a big Japanese businessman, and it's played by my friend Cordelia Choi. So I want to give her a name check. She was actually in our film uh, Purple Storm, which was a, an earlier DVD release uh, where she was playing an ATF commander, and she's coming into frame now. And uh, this is Cordelia's moment. She gets to be the secretary of the guy who's hiring Jackie. And uh, she's a local entrepreneur in Hong Kong and does various businesses. And it's a running gag in the film, this thing with the hammer, which was something that was back in the old Japanese manga and also the animated movies based on the City Hunter character. And in the animated series, the character was voiced by an actor called Akira Kamiya. And um, that was a very popular show. And for some reason, as well as being a hit in Japan, the animated City Hunter was also very popular in uh, France. And I remember the first time I ever saw a City Hunter cartoon was actually uh, on a TV screen when I was shooting a movie in Paris called uh, Gun and Rose, way back when. And there was a cartoon on and somebody told me it was, it was City Hunter, which really took off in France. Um, and it's been made into another movie also in Hong Kong called Mr. Mumble, a play on the name Man Bo, Mr. Mumble, which starred this burly local actor called Michael Chow, who coincidentally had also been with Jackie in a few films, including Miracles. That's kind of a fun movie, but a lot cheaper than this one. And then here we have uh, our Japanese leading lady, Kumiko Goto, who is, um, was a, a rising starlet at this time. Uh, but shortly after the movie was, was made, she kind of had a rapid change in career and life. She married Formula One race car driver Jean Alessi, who's a Sicilian, grew up in France, and um, apparently was on Formula One tour of, of Japan, and uh, met, and this uh, transcultural romance happened, and they now live in Switzerland, and she has a daughter called Helena. But at the time this movie was being made, she was a rising star in Japan, and I think the, the plan was putting her with Jackie would bring her to a new level. And um, Cupid got in the way. So, so there you go. And uh, you notice all the way through the film that Jackie's driving Mitsubishi cars because he is uh, Aisha's Mitsu Mitsu Mr. Mitsubishi. I'll try that again. He's Aisha's Mr. Mitsubishi. He has a long-running contract with Mitsubishi. Whenever he needs cars for his film, he either has them from the local dealer or if they can't get that particular make of car, they fly them out from, from Japan so that he can have a Mitsubishi car. And, you know, heaven forbid that another brand... Actually, this is another brand, but Jackie's not driving it, so that doesn't count. Is that a Mitsubishi? Does not, I'm, I'm, really, I'm a kung fu expert, but not a car expert. So, uh, but if Jackie's driving the car, it's definitely a Mitsubishi. And uh, this sequence um, was shot in Victoria Park, and it's actually in the Tai Chi Garden, though they're not doing Tai Chi, are they? This is a, a, the skateboard sequence. I mean, skateboard in 1992 was like the cutting edge. And so we have a, a sequence where Jackie's on the trail of the, the missing daughter of the Japanese uh, multimillionaire. And, uh, of course, she speaks Cantonese, which at the time was par for the course. Everybody in the movie and later in the film, even the Western actors, spoke Cantonese when they were in uh, a Hong Kong film. I think the first movie that really challenged that was a later Jackie Chan film called Mr. Nice Guy, which he shot entirely on location in Melbourne, Australia, and was dubbed fully into Cantonese for the local market. And uh, the audiences obviously had become more sophisticated between 1992 and, uh, when, and, and when Mr. Nice Guy was made. And there were complaints, why were all Westerners dubbed into flawless Cantonese, that it was unrealistic. So subsequently, most of the Jackie Chan films have been shot in a mixture of languages or just in English, and it seems the local audience will, will accept that. And the chase sequence we're about to see through the busy streets of, uh, of Admiralty is, um, was uh, memorable largely because Jackie, uh, it's the second time, I think, in his movie career that he's done uh, skateboard stunts, the first time being in Wheels on Meals, actually sustained quite a serious ankle injury, one of many, when he, when he came off the, uh, the board. Um, and this is actually the Admiralty area of Hong Kong. I'm just having lunch 
down from the here just today. Isn't that an amazing coincidence? I was just having lunch in this neighbourhood. And, uh, you know, it, the most, probably the most amazing special effect in this film is the idea that you could actually go anywhere in Hong Kong and have an empty street or an empty passageway. That's a real special effect. Uh, and, and in fact, that anybody, that there wouldn't be people running at you or driving at you from all directions if you tried to skateboard down the street. But like I say, this is actually a live-action cartoon, so all things are possible. And certainly in this film, Jackie's uh, character, his persona as uh, an animated hero, get taken in different directions to, to anything we've seen before or since. And I think Jackie himself has said that if, if he himself had directed City Hunter, he would have taken it in a different direction. He would have done a slightly more serious take on City Hunter. Though having seen the, the original manga and the animated show, I think that this film is actually fairly close to the original material. But it was, a, it was planned, it was a, the first of a series. But possibly, uh, the film itself performed pretty well at the box office, both here and especially in Japan, uh, here being in the Asian region, in Hong Kong and elsewhere. And uh, it played well overseas because, I mean, visual humour is what travels as opposed to verbal humour. And here we are, and this isn't actually a set, this is a real store. This is the Galleria, which is still there in Central. And believe me, the speed with which buildings get knocked up and taken down, let me rephrase that, knocked down and taken up, in Hong Kong, uh, it's amazing that anything is still standing that was filmed in 1992. And I just noticed the burly fellow walking by Jackie just then was actually Wong Tin Lam. If you rewind the tape, that was actually the director's father. And I didn't notice that until just now. And uh, I don't know who this... Uh, I have no idea who this guy is, the, 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 the pervert. But you can always tell the perverts in a Wong Jing film because they wear white suits and white hats and uh, funny glasses and have no chins. So that's how you can, you can tell them a mile off. This is actually the Galleria, shooting interiors. In fact, the whole of this sequence with the skateboarding shot within about a mile radius in the, on, on Hong Kong Island. Um, and coincidentally, what a perfect fit. Look at that. She just looks the part. And uh, Jackie, of course, has had a number of different business interests, particularly around the time of City Hunter, uh, including a clothing store and a gym and a garage. But um, to be honest, and he himself would admit this, none of them have been very successful. I mean, really, what he does best is making movies. So the other ventures have all uh, kind of gone away with the fullness of time, except for his rental company. He rents out film equipment to other productions. CineRent has been quite successful. So I think businesses that are related to film are probably his forte and... Uh, these days, he kind of stays away from anything else. Here we are back in the Chan Cave. And uh, this is uh, a running, another running gag in the film, is that he can never get anything to eat. This uh, dates back to something that's a constant uh, a kind of a, a gag in the original comic book, that he can never get uh, enough sex and he can never get enough food. And in the original comic book, if you want to hire City Hunter to take on a case for you, you have to go to the police notice board at a police station and you write the letters X, Y, Z or X, Y, Z, if you're American, and uh, you ask the... Uh, and then City Hunter will come to your help. I guess it's kind of like the, the A-team of uh, Japan, if anybody remembers the A-team. And now all these... Uh, the attractive, allegedly attractive extras being brought in for this very Wong Jing-inspired scene. And, um, again, I'm, I'm impressed by how much this set resembles the, the hangout that Jackie has constructed for himself, which is, I guess, it's the prototype. He has now the prototype for a, a Jackie Chan museum because it has a lot of equipment uh, from his films, all the vehicles, lots of props from movies, uh, including his American films. And uh, sometime in the future, I think he'll probably... It's about time somebody in Hong Kong opened a film-related permanent museum. This is kind of a neat little sequence. Um, I love the way he's flipping over the motorbike there. I mean, obviously it's played for laughs, but I think it's this kind of uh, occasion, this kind of like casual physicality. I mean, you look at American-made martial arts pictures. Normally, they have like kind of uh, one move like that would be the big payoff for a for a fight sequence. And here, really, it's just incidental to the to the action, so that. Um, this is something that has made Jackie appealing to international audiences. It's just that sheer sense of exuberance and fun. And it certainly fits the character here because it is like the live-action cartoon. And uh, here, this is, this is the kind of like uh, mismatch purposes which the comic book was famous for because he's got this conflict with the moonlighting kind of relationship with his partner, who is the daughter of his dead partner. So she's in love with him, and he's in love with her, but they can't ever do anything about it. In the meantime, he's being chased by all these girls, and so there's never a dull moment. And um, at the end of the movie, I think that um, 
the relationship between Jackie and Wong Jing, I think it's safe to say, wasn't very good. So Wong Jing subsequently made a movie called High Risk, in which he was poking fun at Jackie, and not just Jackie, but his, his father and his manager and the people around him. And um, I know, because I spoke to Jackie about it, that he didn't find it very funny. I think he minded so much for making fun of him, because he, he, he's a public figure. But I think he resented the fact that his family were dragged into it. And I can understand uh, his viewpoint on it. I have to say, I think for many Jackie Chan films, higher risk is kind of a guilty pleasure, and it's kind of a, a fun ride in its own right, even though the motive for making it might not have been pure. And uh, the ocean cruiser we see here actually did set sail, which is uh, not something you could say about uh, the, the, the boat in un the Steven Seagal film, Under Siege, which City Hunt has been compared to, at least in terms of the premise. This boat actually did sail out into the, uh, the seas between Hong Kong and Japan, and here comes the villain of the piece, and uh, my old friend Richard Norton, who actually hails from Melbourne, Australia, but has been working in Hollywood for a good number of years now. And in this movie, uh, he gets to be funny. Normally, uh, American-made martial arts stars have to play a very straight arrow, but when he was hired for City Hunter, they wanted a, a bad guy who was kind of flamboyant and over the top, a bit camp even. And Richard rose to the task admirably. And he actually is a funny guy off camera. I mean, if you hang out with him and his wife, Judy, it's really like being in a, a sitcom. And he has the comic timing down. Richard had worked with Jackie before on the movie Twinkle, Twinkle, Lucky Stars, and also with Wong Jing on uh, Magic Crystal. So I think he was an obvious choice for somebody to, to play the main bad guy in the piece. And I've, on here we have um, two of our side cast of leading ladies, and this is leading the, leading the phrase Ching Mi Yao, Yao Suk Jing, who was uh, an actress whose career was guided by uh, Wong Jing during this period, and uh, her busty sidekick. And I think this is a staple of any Wong Jing movie, humor at this level. Um, somebody once said that many of the Jackie movies, you actually have three actresses in search of a brain. And uh, certainly there's a bit of that in this movie. Though I have to say, Ching Mi Yao... Um, who's best known internationally for her role in the movie Naked Killer, or perhaps for her role in the posters for the film Naked Killer, is very gung-ho in the action scenes later in the piece and certainly does her best to match wits and flying fists and feet with the, the other people in the film. Uh, going back to talk about uh, uh, Richard for a moment, uh, I did hear that another actor called Keith Vitale was considered for the role of the main bad guy in the movie. And he'd also worked with Jackie on Wheels on Meals. But I think because Norton was known to Jackie and known to Wong Jing, he was a first choice. The gentleman there playing the first mate is the late Lewis Roth, who was a, a veteran actor working in Hong Kong movies, a Western actor, always playing police commanders. He passed away a couple of years ago. He also ran the nearest thing that I've ever seen to uh, an actor's studio in Hong Kong. He used to have actor's classes, primarily for Westerners, but also for English-speaking Chinese. And you can see him also in Drunken Master 2 and another uh, few films. Maybe his finest hour was Ringo Lam's Undeclared War, where he had quite a good acting role, and he also wrote the English script for the film. And here's the, the boat actually setting sail. And uh, a bit later in the movie, we see Gary Daniels, who's uh, the sidekick of Richard Norton in the movie. And Gary was working on another film when he was hired to be in this one and uh, suddenly found himself out to sea on this cruise ship with all these gorgeous girls and Jackie Chan and doing a Hong Kong action movie. And his thing was like, hey, you know, you're getting paid for this? You know, what, a, what a great opportunity. I love this. This is a great kind of silent comedy moment and uh, the kind of shot that you don't see in many movies. This is the kind of visual humor that, that kind of works around the world as he's free and clear. And the, the, the running gag again, you know, that he's looking for dinner. And then steps away. This was actually shot on the back lot at Golden Harvest, not on the boat. And then uh, wrecks the place before heading off. And the, the white suit is like, uh, has since become a staple of Jackie Chan's characters. But I think this is the first movie where he's decked in white from head to foot pretty much throughout the movie. White and red. And then he has his black braces. And uh, they actually went to the expense of going out to sea. And there's Lewis Roth again, and behind him, a key member of the Jackie Chan stunt team, Sam Wong, Wong Min Sing, who uh, is probably best known for his role as the, the kind of cadet martial arts instructor that Jackie has a duel with in Police Story 3. And he's also, as well as being um, a good martial arts uh, exponent, is a very good gymnast, and that's uh, one of the strengths that he has on the Jackie Chan team. And the, um, this sequence is... Uh, it's kind of interesting because it's like a, a kind of 
a typical example of the kind of comedy that Jackie does very well, which is where there's no dialogue required, and it's all down to the camera editing and the movement in frame as to what's going on. And I think it's one of the reasons his films travel very well, is because you don't really need to depend upon uh, the, the verbal humour to find out what's going on. Whereas movies of other Hong Kong comedians like Stephen Chow Sing Chi haven't worked so well overseas because you really have to have a pretty sophisticated knowledge of the Cantonese dialect to understand the humour. Whereas uh, in Jackie's movies, they, they don't really rely on verbal gags so much as sight gags. Case in point, this, which is, I have to say, is pretty low down and dirty slapstick. And here comes one of the great unsung heroes of the, the Jackie Chan world, Adun, William Dun, one of Jackie's uh, bodyguards and uh, a regular uh, punch bag in this sequence anyway. And he's always turning up in different roles in, in Jackie's movies. And he's a lot of fun to be around. He's a, he's a fun guy. But uh, every time they need a, how does one put it politely, heavy set gentleman for a specific scene, normally Adun is, is, is kind of, uh, Adun is, is rolled into service. And often you'll see him three or four times in the same picture. Okay. Speaking of people uh, making cameos, look at this guy in the foreground. It's just like Jackie. And uh, we watched it a bunch of times, and I'm not quite sure whether it is or not, but it's the kind of gag that he would like to play, I think, uh, honking the horn to knock himself off the bridge. So you rewind the DVD a bunch of times, and you, you write in and tell everybody at Medusa whether it's Jackie Chan or not, because um, I was watching it here, and I'm, I'm not clear. But definitely there are movies where Jackie's been in the background of his own film as an extra, and that's part of the fun of a Jackie Chan movie, is that you can watch it a bunch of times and then uh, play uh, spot the background cast. Maybe we should have a special competition on a future DVD, uh, how many times you can see Ardun or one of the others in a film. Interesting to note the, the uniformity of the production design in this movie, because most Hong Kong films don't really have outstanding design, especially not the movies of this era. But here you see the costumes, the background sets, the lighting, have all got a, a uniformity of style to them with these primary colours, which kind of reflect the cartoon nature of the film. Um, uh, this is actually a set. This was constructed at Golden Harvest Studios. They didn't have rooms quite as luxurious or as brightly coloured uh, on the actual boat. And I remember reading uh, the review that Roger Ebert wrote for Shanghai Noon, and uh, he was quoting Jean-Luc Godard, who'd said the best way to critique an, a film is to make another film, and that, and that on that basis, Shanghai Noon was a review of Wild Wild West. So I guess, in a way, City Hunter might be seen as a review of Under Siege with uh, a similar premise of an action hero trapped on a boat which has been taken over by terrorists. But I remember I once, when I wrote my review of City Hunter, I suggested that this might be what you would see if you dropped acid while watching Under Siege. Not that I'm advising anybody in the audience to use and abuse drugs, but um, from what people have told me about the experience of taking that particular hallucinogenic, I think uh, you could easily transform Steven Seagal to Jackie Chan. And uh, here we have a great introductory scene for one of uh, my best buddies and one of the great uh, martial arts action heroes ever to come out of the UK, or anywhere for that matter, which is Gary Daniels. And this sequence, I remember Gary told me, uh, Jackie himself took uh, great lengths to choreograph for him. It was actually shot on a set at Golden Harvest. And they went out to the back lot, and because Gary is such a die-hard uh, Bruce Lee fan and Jackie Chan fan. I mean, he just got a kick out of the fact that he was getting to do this uh, great introductory sequence on exactly the same back lot where uh, Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan had shot so many of their classic movies. So he got this really good intro to set up. And it's interesting because the way he's used in the film, we get the big setup of him as a real deal, ferocious fighter, and there's no real payoff at the end because the, the, comp the fight scenes with him are pretty much played for laughs. And uh, the guy in the blue suit there is uh, Mike Abbott, who uh, works in Hong Kong as a security guy. He's a doorman at various clubs, and he's been in Hong Kong quite a while and done various different things and appeared in many films. Probably he's uh, infamous for being in the movie uh, Final Termination, where he's in a car and holding uh, some four-year-old girl out of the, the, the window of a speeding car. And I guess if that could be defined as a moment of fame, that was his moment. This, is, uh, this sequence actually was shot once in the boat en route to Japan and uh, was then reshot in Hong Kong at a, uh, a sports ground because originally, uh, I think they complained when they got the rushes back that the girls on the boat who were travelling were not pretty enough. So uh, Wong Jing insisted that they come back and they reshoot the sequence again in Hong Kong. 
So um, in this probably <laughs> reaches a kind of a, a low in terms of uh, the Wong Jing inspired comedy because women are always objectified in Wong Jing's films. And uh, I think something in the Hong Kong male uh, psyche, they're both intimidated by, they're intimidated by strong women. So in this movie, Wong Jing gets to, you know, present the ultimate fantasy, which is, I think, you know, women on the menu or like woman, woman as fast food. And uh, he's, he's doing it figurative, literally rather than figuratively. And this is a shot that you probably would not see in uh, a Hollywood movie anytime soon, unless I guess it was like a National Lampoon or something like that. Woman as chicken drumstick. All you feminists out there, take note, this is a Wong Jing movie and not a Jackie Chan one. So, uh, but this kind of stuff plays very well. And uh, I remember seeing the movie in Hong Kong and it kind of, it really brought the house down at the midnight show. And the midnight screenings in the, in the golden era of Hong Kong film, that really could make and break a film, which is why sometimes you see these movies and they're really playing to the gallery in terms of cheap humour because you were playing to a crowd of people who'd come out at midnight, maybe after a good dinner and a few beers, and uh, they wanted to see something fast and funky and cheap and cheerful. And uh, here's Gary and Mike. Mike's got that Hannibal Lecter let glare down to a fine art, hasn't he? And... Um, he, he was, um, there's always a kind of a floating cast of Westerners in Hong Kong movies, and they've really fallen into two categories. There are the guys that do martial arts who kind of have envis in visions of becoming martial arts stars in, in Hong Kong movies, which never really has happened for any Western performer. And the others are people who have other jobs working at banks or insurance companies or carpet stores, and uh, they just... Um, happen to work part-time in local films. And after you start seeing a few Hong Kong movies, you start recognizing them in, uh, as regular, familiar faces. And the lovely, the lovely Joey Wong, she was always, um, she, prior to Chinese Ghost Story, she was kind of typecast playing kind of bimbo roles. And then in Chinese Ghost Story, she played this ethereal femme fatale. And that typecaster as well and she was in uh, two official sequels to Chinese Ghost Story but many other spin-offs and this was actually one of the few films that she made uh, which was a mainstream movie a contemporary mainstream movie where she was opposite an established leading man and I don't know that she was ever that great an actress but um, she certainly uh, had a screen presence and uh, very very photogenic particularly in the, the period films. And she never played a character quite as broadly as she does in this movie, which is like a uh, very over-the-top, jealous uh, female sidekick. And uh, she, was, um, she married the Taiwanese singer Chai Chun in a ceremony in Tibet and kind of retired briefly from the industry. And as I mentioned earlier, she just made her comeback. And there's Gary again, who was actually working on another film uh, called Nights with Albert Pyun when he was signed to be in uh, City Hunter. And Albert very kindly released him ahead of his contract so that he could come and be in City Hunter because Albert Pyun too was a Jackie Chan fan. So thanks to Albert for that, otherwise we wouldn't see Gary in the film. Here we are at the gambling set. This actually was constructed over at Shaw Brothers because uh, all the sets at uh, Golden Harvest were taken up, all the sound stages in the studio were taken up by various other productions, so uh, they had to build this over at the Shaw Brothers lot. Kind of interesting because Golden Harvest and Shaw Brothers were rivals. And uh, the handsome Chinese gambler in this scene is played by Leon Lai, Lai Ming, one of the four golden kings of Canto Pop. And uh, Wong Jing had already established the Dou San, or the God of Gamblers character, with his film God of Gamblers with Chai Yun-Fat. And uh, he kind of tested this young version of the character here with Leon Lai. And he used the same actor in God of Gambler the Early Years, which was um, a prequel to God of Gamblers, in which he, uh, Leon Lai plays basically the same character he plays here in City Hunter, which is this kind of slick card sharp who uh, throws razor-sharp cards and is an expert on martial arts and is kind of a younger version of the character Zhao Yun-Fat played in the original God of Gamblers movie. And... Uh, this fellow gets to do most of the Wong Jing style street level humor in this film. And it's an acquired taste, I guess. It plays really well. To, I can tell you it plays, plays really well to Cantonese audiences. But I don't know how well this, this actually travels because it does depend on understanding Cantonese slang to really be funny. And that brought the house down in Mong Kok. So, um, 
This was a, a really an amazing set to visit. Uh, I actually saw it only after it had been destroyed. Now, here come the uh, hard, soft kids. These guys were well, the soft, hard kids, to put them in the right order. They're actually two popular radio DJs. The guy on the left is Eric Kotmanfai, who was the soft, and the one on the right is uh, Jan Lam, who was hard, though, uh, you know, you kind of have a tough time telling them apart. Um, Kotman Fai, actually, is a, a contrary to the character he plays in this movie, he's a pretty smart guy. He was also cast in a gambling movie by Wong Jing, which was called Saint of Gamblers, in which he inherited uh, a role that had been originated by Stephen Chow Sing Chi. And uh, he's also gave a good acting role performance in a, in a romantic comedy, Feel 100%, and had a cameo in a movie that I just worked on called Gen Y Cops, in which he plays like a wacky mainland Chinese rocket scientist, or robot scientist. And he also directed a movie called Litter on the Breeze. So he's no dummy, but he, he's always playing these kind of out-there wacky characters in uh, Hong Kong films. And his partner, Jan Lam, is actually the brother of Jerry Lam, who is one of the regulars in the Young and Dangerous gangster movie series, the Guat Jai films. And he's the brother of uh, Sandy Lam, who's a, a famous singer in Taiwan and Hong Kong. She's also acted in films. You may remember her from a film called Three Against the World, which starred Andy Lau. And uh, she's a uh, very good singer and never really taken off as an actress. But uh, she was in that film and a couple of others because it's kind of obligatory, I think, if you're a Hong Kong singer that you have to appear in movies at the same time. And this kind of song and dance number, again, probably plays better in Hong Kong than it did in the rest of uh, the world. And Gary, I remember, told me when, when he was over in Hong Kong shooting the film, and uh, every time he would call up and, you know, say, are we shooting today? And he would, they'd say, no, no, you have another day off because they haven't finished the, the musical number yet. And he was kind of thought he'd been hired to be in a martial arts action film, and so he was like, the musical number, like, uh, what kind of film are they making? What indeed? Um, but uh, soft, hard kids were very popular as DJs. And being a DJ in Hong Kong can lead to all manner of things. I mean, DJs become film directors, actors, uh, authors, any other number of subsidiary careers. And uh, these guys became popular recording artists. And they, they were probably the, uh, the first Hong Kong rappers as such. I remember seeing a CD cover with them when they were done up like uh, Marky Mark who was really popular at that time. They had their heads grafted onto these bodybuilder bodies. So they took their while shooting this uh, scene and incorporating uh, Ching Miao and her, her partner in crime. So um, there's something, something for everyone, a Wong Jing movie tonight. Even girls in the bunny costumes. I hadn't noticed that before. Kind of a quick Playboy reference being slid into the mix. And back to the, uh, the young god of gamblers. And uh, Leon Lai is an actor who's, uh, you know, been used in uh, many films. I mean, he's, he's a good dramatic actor, as he proved in the film Comrades, almost a love story by Peter Chan. Uh, this year he was in the, the very disappointing sequel to Downtown Torpedoes. Downtown Torpedoes was an action film made a couple of years back by Teddy Chan, and they did a semi-sequel this year called Skyline Cruisers. They couldn't actually use the name Downtown Torpedoes again because it had been optioned by an American company. So they shot uh, Skyline Cruises, which is far inferior to the original film. Um, but uh, he, here he has a nice little cameo and uh, can steal, gets to steal a couple of scenes. And uh, he doesn't really get to interface with Jackie very much. But uh, I think Wong Jing is somebody who likes to make movies that will play to the broadest possible audience. And at this time the film was made, I think it was perceived that Jackie's audience in Hong Kong was skewed slightly older and the audience for the Golden Kings of Canto Pop was slightly younger. So by having people like Soft Hard Kids and uh, Leon Lai in the film, you could actually play to a slightly younger audience. And it definitely worked because uh, the, the, the film did very well at the box office and brought in a really wide demographic. And there's Sam Wong again, left of frame, and uh, he keeps popping up as this uh, righteous uh, security chief aboard the boat. And... Uh, the uh, typical God of Gamblers slow motion hair blowing moment there. Ching Miao, who just retired from acting after she got married, that's a shame. And there's Mike Abbott suiting up for battle. And uh, his partner in crime is uh, played by Vincent Laporte, who I happened to run into one time in a, uh, some coffee shop here in Hong Kong. He's actually a businessman. He worked at a French company called Dragage. And uh, he had 
you know, just was in the right place at the right time and somebody said, you have a good look, would you be prepared to shave your head and be a bad guy in a Jackie Chan movie? So, uh, you know, he went for it and uh, here he is immortalised for all time. Uh, back with Kumi Kogoto. And uh, she was typical of the kind of the painfully young uh, actresses who were popular in Japan. I mean, you know, barely into their teens. And uh, they're already like these Talento pop idols. Writer frame, that was uh, Ken Lo there, Lo Wei Gong, Jackie's bodyguard, who's uh, firing his gun prematurely. And Richard, I mean, this is one of those movies where I wish they were shooting sync sound because I think the, Richard's performance, particularly in this film, was, was a lot of fun because he was really playing it to the hilt and uh, he, he was told it to play as a kind of camp, tongue-in-cheek bad guy and uh, that's, what, that's what he does. The interesting thing about the movie is the fact that even though it's played very broadly, there is incidental violence in the film where people are shot and uh, the actual bloodletting happens off camera. But there's like a casual nature to the violence, which is really quite callous. And again, it's kind of out of character for a Jackie Chan movie. And I think in subsequent interviews, he's often said that there are certain rules for a Jackie Chan film. There's no violence, um, no dirty words, no sex. And um, uh, I think this movie, in that he'd given over control of the direction to Wong Jing, it allowed elements to get into the film which you don't find in other Jackie Chan films. Personally, I could do without... I think if you're going to have gunplay in a film, there's nothing wrong with that, but you should have responsible gunplay in that it's uh, gunplay where uh, you see the actual horrible results of people firing live ammunition at one another. And that if you, if you actually do it the A-team style where bullets are fired and no one's ever hurt or cars crash and no one's ever hurt... You're kind of cheapening uh, the experience and you're creating a dangerous precedent in people's minds that actually doesn't matter whether you, whether you fire guns at people or not. And obviously recent incidents in America have proved that it's important that, though I don't believe that films themselves should be censored, that at least filmmakers within the film should present gunplay in a realistic way. And people tend to get up in arms about the realistic depiction. I personally think unrealistic depiction of gunplay is causing the greater harm in the long run because it desensitizes younger viewers to the, the power of gunplay. This is the big moment for Lewis Roth. And uh, Lewis sadly passed away from cancer a, a few years ago. And uh, he is somebody I know took great pride in his acting. And uh, he, he actually didn't... He's an example of somebody going to Hong Kong with really no background in a specific field and reinventing themselves by virtue of the fact that they can actually do what they want to do. I mean, I don't think he ever had any acting training or any acting background in the United States, that I know of anyway. I mean, I may be wrong, but the only films I've ever seen him in or known of him being associated with were Hong Kong productions. And he wanted to be a movie actor, and he came to Hong Kong and said, I'm a movie actor, and that's what he did. Which is, I think, the amazing thing about Hong Kong, uh, certainly in my own case it's true, where you can come to Hong Kong and basically reinvent yourself as the person you want to be uh, living the life you choose to have and providing you're prepared to work hard enough and you have a certain amount of luck and a certain, I guess a certain amount of talent, and you can do it. And I think Lewis, um, within the constraints of the kind of roles he was given, was a decent actor. And Jackie certainly thought so because he used him in a number of movies and... Uh, the thing about Jackie, I think, he really likes people who turn up and get on with the job and people who are low maintenance. And I think Lewis was like that. He was really serious about what he was doing and he would turn up and he would act and uh, Jackie wouldn't have to worry about him being on time or worry about him uh, having an emotional breakdown or something because worked, Jackie's worked with all different kinds of characters during his long career in, uh, in action filmmaking. So for that reason, uh, Lewis would keep returning. This is Vincent's big moment. Uh, you know he's playing this wide-eyed killer in the movie, but he's in person. He's such soft-spoken, very strong uh, French accent because he's he's from France. I think his his mum is Algerian. But uh, I, when I met him, I got to try out my high school French, which probably amused him about as much as my Cantonese amuses amuses Chinese people. Here's a great moment in movie history. Really, the 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 uh, the third on-screen encounter between. Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee. And, uh, of course, the first was in uh, Fist of Fury, second one in Enter the Dragon, and now in City Hunter, though they're not actually sharing the same frame side by side anymore. They're actually in the shot, and we see Game of Death playing here. 
this was actually a theatre in Hong Kong. It wasn't on the boat. Um, or even a, it wasn't a set at Golden Harvest, actually in a movie theatre in Hong Kong, which they rigged up after hours for this sequence. Um, and a very good, it, very, it shows the inventiveness of uh, Wong Jing and, and his team, because I think this suggestion came from Wong Jing, that what they would have is a Jackie Chan film fight sequence played out against the background of a Bruce Lee scene, and later in the sequence, Bruce uses his, uh, Jackie uses the techniques that Bruce is doing on the screen to enable him to defeat his opponents. And it's very imaginative and something I don't think you'd necessarily see in a, an American-made martial arts action picture. Again, you see very casual gunplay violence, and it's played for laughs. This is funny. She's saying, you know, how handsome he looks. So Jackie thinks it's him, but actually she's talking about Bruce. Which is kind of funny, because I think Bruce, uh, Jackie has kind of a mixed feeling about Bruce Lee, because... Um, He's always, always asked, who's better, you or Bruce Lee? Um, who would win in a fight, you or Bruce Lee? And uh, I think his feeling is that, yes, Bruce is a legend. Bruce isn't around anymore, so nobody will ever be able to compete with Bruce Lee in a realistic way. But at the same time that he, Jackie, has established his own legend in his own way and should not have to keep answering questions about Bruce Lee. So there's a tip for all you interviewers out there or any of you fans that meet Jackie. Maybe a good idea not to ask him, what do you think about Bruce Lee? Because he's kind of answered that question a bunch of times. And here, these two towering black basketball players. And uh, let me tell you, this, these were tough roles to cast. I remember uh, when the film was in production and... Uh, they got lucky because uh, M. Sian, who the, was the producer of Snake in the Eagle Shadow and Drunken Master, his other uh, main area of expertise and enthusiasm is basketball. And there's a clever, uh, a relatively clever play because in the, in the Bruce Lee movie Game of Death, of course, he gets a big black footprint on his yellow suit. And they kind of referred to that there with Jackie in the white suit. Going back to Mc and he'd actually spo he actually sponsors basketball players to come to uh, Hong Kong to uh, to uh, play against local teams and to coach local players because Mc Yun loves basketball. Probably loves basketball more than he loves kung fu these days because he's done a bunch of kung fu movies already. And um, so Golden Harvest rang him up and said, do you, do you know anybody who's coming into town? And I think they kind of joined forces to fly in a couple of basketball players. And the deal was, you know, you get to teach basketball down at the Yamate Civic Center, and at night you get to shoot, you get to fight Jackie Chan up at Golden Harvest. So a pretty good deal for these guys. I mean, and certainly uh, Mc and got value for money. And uh, now we have the interplay, Jackie trying to use his technique against these towering opponents. And it's kind of it's it's interesting challenge because neither of these guys are trained martial artists, but you have to have. I mean, of course, they're obviously much taller than him, but he has to have them interact in such a way that it's uh, that's realistic. That a trained martial artist like Jackie will have a hard time, and that's actually much harder to do than when you're working with somebody who's uh, actually a trained fighter or somebody with that sense of rhythm and timing. And here, Jackie's using the techniques from Bruce to. Uh, take out the first one of his opponents. And here comes the second guy, and he's shoulder-pressing Kumiko Goto. Oh, nice work if you can get it. And um, she's a classic damsel in distress. Look at the reaction shot. This is the typical Wong Jing reaction shot. Uh, Joey Wong does the same one later in the movie when she also gets dropped on the ground. It's kind of a very cartoony shot. And uh, remember, there was actually the last time Jackie fought a black guy in a theatre probably was in Battle Creek Brawl. One of his best fights is this little action sequence in the, towards the end of the picture when he's in a movie theatre. And uh, this is really played for laughs and uh, it's the style that Jackie's made famous, the fact that he's like this kind of vulnerable martial arts expert. And uh, he gets a break in the action then when, of course, he can uh, warm himself up and then take note of what Bruce Lee is doing as like a technique with which he can beat his own opponent. And it's cool, and it's great to see uh, to see the two of them like side by side. Because I I can never understand why there had to be like an either or of people who were fans of Jackie and fans of Bruce. Because it's evident that you know what Bruce Lee was doing was excellent and brilliant in one direction, and Jackie's what Jackie's doing, still doing, is brilliant and excellent in a completely different direction. And uh, they were never trying to compete. I mean. Maybe the guys who were coming in the 70s who were really just the clones of Bruce Lee could be, uh, could be accused of being uh, just carbon copies of the great master. But Jackie certainly never made any efforts to be the new Bruce Lee.
even though he might have been sold as that in his early career. And uh, I love this exchange here. And we were doing a documentary, Jackie Chan, My Stunts, or was it My Story? I think it was My Story. My colleague Peter Poon and I got to dub that, and uh, I got to be Bruce. You are welcome. And he got to be Jackie. So we thought that was probably the, the high point of our dubbing careers, to dub the voices of Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan, respectively. And uh, this is really, as I said before, the, uh, the day-glow version of Under Siege, with the, uh, the terrorists taking over a cruise ship, though in Under Siege, of course, it was actually a warship, and here it's a pleasure cruiser. And um, interesting, I don't know who got the idea first. I mean, they were actually shot round about the same time. So I was kidding earlier about the, the idea that this film was a review of Under Siege because they were actually in production at the same time. I think Under Siege actually started a little later than City Hunter. But I wouldn't put it past Wong Jing that he heard the premise of Under Siege and thought it would be a fun idea to put Jackie in, in a similar predicament. Richard Norton marching into the fray. His character in this movie is called uh, Donald Mac, a play on uh, Mac Donald's. I mean, Wong Jing's films are always replete with pop culture references. That's actually a CG shot then. They couldn't actually get the timing of the champagne bottle and the gunshot. And uh, at this stage in Hong Kong film, they were not really using a lot of CG for anything other than uh, animation. And what you see was what you got. For the wire stunts, um, they were just starting to use uh, some digital removal for the wires. But normally they would just light the scene in such a way that the wires weren't visible. And uh, you'll see there were, you know, wires were used throughout the Shaw Brothers era of uh, filmmaking. And you can't really see them uh, on the print because of the, the lighting effects that were used. I think it's probably the first kick, real kick, that uh, Joey Wong ever threw in anger in a movie. She was not known for doing action. So this was her, her first time up to bat. Short and sweet. But she was, she was, uh, really seems to be having fun with this character and with this role. And there's Gary looking mean and malevolent. And uh, it's funny when you see him, you know, cast as a bad guy because, I mean, he's like the nicest guy on the planet. And uh, he was going through this period early in his career where, like most uh, martial arts guys, including Bruce Lee and, and, and many others, when and Chuck Norris, you know, they start out, they always get to play the bad guy to start with. And, uh, and he was doing it in this and some other films. And it was just particularly uh, extraordinary, I think, for people like me who knew him quite well because to think of him as being evil <laughs> was quite a stretch and, and more, more power to his acting ability that he managed to pull it off. Here's a kind of neat gadget, the, uh, the fingerprint reading device, and uh, this again plays back to the original manga comic book in which uh, Mambo would always be, or Ryu Saber would always be bringing out gadgets um, which he happened to have stashed away in a pocket to fit the situation. And uh, this also plays to the fact that he's meant to be uh, humps up or like a sex maniac. Humps up means hot salty in Chinese and it's uh, the, use, the phrase you used for somebody who is a sex maniac. And uh, they're dressed as a matching set in white, uh, which is another one of the colour scheme choices of the film. And uh, quite a number of times you see that actually white people, people in white suits against a, a white background, which is uh, a sign that there is a kind of uniformity, as I mentioned before, to the costume and the set design which is quite interesting. And then um, this is like uh, a nice sight gag as he's reading the fingerprints off the actual finger of the hand that is attached to none other than Lo Wei Gong, who is a big fan favourite. He's a former Thai boxing champion and Jackie's real-life bodyguard. And uh, again, you know, that kind of casual gunplay violence, which I... I don't really like, and I think it detracts from this kind of a film. I'm certainly not a Puritan when it comes to action movies, but uh, I think you basically have to make a decision what kind of movie you're going to make. And uh, this film kind of crosses the lines in, in a couple of shots. And there are also issues raised about the, the homophobia, that there are actually some scenes here with um, abuse to gay people, and these were apparently trimmed out of an, American, an early American print of the film, an international print of the movie that was released for the, for the American market. Here we have uh, MacDonald reading his list of demands. And uh, he's actually uh, is a wonderfully wacko character. And uh, it's too bad they weren't shooting Sink Sad, as I mentioned before, because I think Richard must be a riot. And uh, each of these poor souls gets called up to gamble with him. And uh, again, the, the, the color coding, uh, people in white in a, a white environment, 
Here's the game room. This was actually a set at Golden Harvest, and all of the game stations, all the game consoles actually worked. And they're the soft, hard kids um, being mistaken for terrorists, which means Jackie has an odd idea about how terrorists dress and act, even in a Wong Jing film. But no, this, this whole set was constructed uh, on the back lot, and um, using all the characters, as you see on the background, we've got all the characters from the Street Fighter video game. Wong Jing, a big fan of Street Fighter, he actually used all the characters in, a, in an earlier film called Super Cops. But I don't think he got the rights, which is why the film has, I don't think, ever been released anywhere except Hong Kong. And it just came out on DVD in Hong Kong. And back at Shaw Brothers, back in the, the game room, with the functioning TV screens, I mean, there's really no expense spared on this picture. They really uh, went to town on the sets. And uh, everybody's being uh, asked to give over their jewellery to the masked uh, terrorists, all of whom are Jackie Chan stuntmen, or with a few extras thrown in for good measure. But normally when you see masked characters in Jackie's movie, it's the stuntmen, because they get at that time the team got paid to be on the set, so they were going to be used for something. Lo Gong, of course, made his name as uh, Jackie's op opponent for the final reel of Drunken Master 2, but he's also been used to good effect in... Uh, uh, many other movies. I mean, he's fighting Jackie in the tr on the train at the end of uh, Police Story 3. Here we see the soft heart kids uh, making their, their call for assistance and uh, another pop culture reference thrown in by Wong Jing because uh, he's always somebody who wanted to find uh, new ways to refer to uh, cultural touchstones. So we have a quick Beatles moment coming up as they send out the number to help. And uh, that's just kind of fun, you know, little touches. And as I say, the only time we get, we're seeing CG in this movie is really for full-on animation. And now we see uh, Donald Mack's sadistic card game. And uh, Richard really, really plays this to the hilt. And uh, I remember when he was doing um, Mr. Nice Guy, in which he's also the bad guy, he, he, Samo, really, Samo Hong, who was the director, really said, listen, don't play it normal because nobody remembers normal. And definitely this is the case here with this character. This poor Adun, Jackie's bodyguard and uh, general all-round helper as a short-lived gambler. And because uh, Hong Kong people love to gamble. So gambling scenes are a staple of, uh, of, of Hong Kong action movies, though the stakes are seldom higher. And again, the, the disposable supporting cast. So... Uh, uh, and uh, this guy, also a regular uh, Western actor in Hong Kong movies of that era. And he was in and out of the picture. And uh, Richard told me when he shot the sequence, he was like, uh, boy, they're really taking this to the edge and beyond. And there's the maniacal laugh without which no Westerner bad guy in a Hong Kong movie would be complete. They all have to, at one point, laugh and, and probably beat up on a cute girl like Joey Wong as well. But uh, the kind of... The maniacal cackle is kind of like a, a stock in trade for Western bad guys in uh, in these films. As Gary giving it the mean glare, that's actually Hung Ju that he's being offered by that dope on the right there. Hung Ju is like a, a smelling ointment in Hong Kong. When you're feeling tired, you, you take a sniff of that and uh, you'll feel reinvigorated. So <laughs> that guy is suggesting that maybe Gary's going to get tired during his, uh, his, uh, his molestation of Joey Wong, so he's offering him the Hung Ju. Leon coming up to bat with his uh, battle of wits with uh, with Donald Mack, and uh, he's a good-looking guy. He's a good singer, actually. Of the of the four golden kings of canto pop, I think he's the second best singer. The first best being Jackie Chung, second being him, the third being um, Andy Lau, and the fourth being Aaron Kwok. Though I have to say, Aaron Kwok can dance up a storm. But uh, Leon, uh, nice-looking guy, and. Uh, was used in a number of movies as an action actor. If you see him with uh, Frankie Chan in the movie Fun and Fury, they made him look pretty good in that film. And um, in fact, each one of the canto pop idols at various times has done an action movie, even though they never trained in martial arts officially. And they, they, such as their courage and, and, and willingness and such as the, the ability of Hong Kong choreographers, that they can look pretty good doing it. Nice look to the set, uh, this one out at Shaw Brothers, and they really went to town to give it a a kind of a, a day-glow 70s disco feel with the uh, this kind of uh, glow-in-the-dark effect, the uh, fluorescent lighting. But it was actually quite painful on the eyes. I actually visited this set and the the, uh, the Street Fighter set up at Golden Harvest, and I know that, uh, that lighting uh, in the previous scene, the, set, the lighting in the casino, when you're actually on there for quite a while, you'd get a headache because everything was glowing.
And uh, it was uh, the amazing thing about Hong Kong movie sets is the fact how, that I guess because uh, the manpower is, is cheaper in, in Asia, they actually build everything for real. So mostly everything you see is a working scale model. I mean, they could really have, if they'd kept the set intact, they could have opened the nightclub or a disco afterwards. Whereas um, on American movie sets, there like, seem to be large areas where there are breakaways where the lighting and the camera uh, get onto the set, but here they pretty much build the set and then uh, move the camera around within the the confines of a, a real environment. So what you're seeing is really there. And when when you were on the set, you would have believed that this was actually a casino on a boat, and uh, there wasn't like one side missing or the ceiling missing for the lights to to come down. There was actually a, a fully operating ceiling, and uh, the flying cards, uh, which are the stock in trade of the young god of gamblers. And there's uh, Jing Miao leaping into action a moment ago. And uh, she's uh, somebody who's very good at... Uh, she's not trained in martial arts as such, but she was really gung-ho. And uh, I think you only really find out when somebody gets on a movie set whether they're really going to go for it in terms of doing action scenes. And she never really did that many full-on action movies. I mean, she's more famous for Naked Killer, which is kind of, a, a, I would say, better known for the poster than it is for the quality of the film itself. And there's a nice bit of acrobatic gunplay by Jackie. Um, and this moment, I think that's probably the only time in a Jackie film that he actually shoots somebody at close range, even though it is played for laughs and uh, he doesn't do it to, on purpose. But he, now here's a moment you only see in, in this kind of film, a man fly, well, on, a, on a flying dolphin firing a, a semi-automatic. Uh, you will not see that in a Steven Seagal movie anytime soon. And uh, this is th these two are actually a kind of a good double act because uh, even though she was not uh, trained in doing action, uh, I have to say that uh, Ching Mi Yao really gave it a hundred percent. And now the uh, the kind of the bizarre courtship ritual between Gary and uh, uh, Joey Wong, and this is kind of like I don't know it plays to the kind of thing that Wong Jing likes to to have in his movies, which is kind of really kind of perverted relationships between men and women and uh this is kind of, this was shot on the this is actually a set uh on the studio at golden harvest and i remember gary telling me when he he came in to do the movie i mean he had no idea that this was a comedy as such that it was such a broad comedy that it that so much of it was going to be played for laughs i mean even compared to the other uh jackie chan movies the comedy in this film is is, is pretty pretty broad so the pretext of the film is that they're trying to uh, arouse each other by beating each other up. So uh, this is probably Wong Jing's idea of how uh, Western guys uh, treat their women. So uh, that's why he wants to have this. And these, these pratfalls, I mean, basically every time some poor girl gets slammed on the ground, she does uh, a, the similar reaction shot, which again is very much inspired by the Japanese manga cartoons. And uh, Gary getting to participate in some slapstick here. When he probably came out, I'm sure when he was going to do the film, he anticipated that he was going to do, like, uh, you know, some uh, slam-bang martial arts. And really, we don't get to see too much of that. Here's his one line in Cantonese. Lam lama, are you feeling comfortable? And she's a whole lama, very comfortable. That was the one line he said in the... He told me that was the one line in Cantonese he actually delivered in Chinese in the whole film. It's probably the least flattering shot of Gary that's ever been used in a, in a movie there because he's a, he's a handsome guy, great physique. And, and I was just with him just a few weeks ago, and, and he's still in great shape and, uh, and working all the time. And now uh, the man in black versus the man in the white suit. It's a classic showdown. And uh, Gary told me when they were prepping and rehearsing for the scene, he thought that it was just a, a, a martial arts duel and uh, didn't appreciate that it was actually going to be scored and edited the way it was, which is uh, more for comedic effect than for the martial arts. But actually, it was um, shooting on the set. I mean, it's uh, the same demand on somebody to shoot a comedy fight scene as to shoot a serious one. So uh, they had to get the timing down. And uh, actually, on, I remember seeing some of the footage that Gary himself shot on the set of the movie. And... Um, you know, the timing was off on one take, and he actually clocked Jackie pretty hard on the side of the head. I think it was the same side of the head where he got the injury from our regard, where I know he's very sensitive about being hit because he has that, still has that hole in his skull where uh, 
He sustained a serious injury after falling off a castle wall in Yugoslavia, which I'm sure all you Jackie Chan fans know about. And so he always worried about... He's always overprotective. He says himself he's overprotective of that side of his head when he's shooting uh, fight sequences. But this is really that terrific back-and-forward timing that uh, is something that made Jackie Chan's martial arts movies different from those made elsewhere in the world. And... Uh, it is indeed, it's scored for comic effect, but the discipline and the, the skill involved is just as great as for any other kind of fight. And uh, it's, it's uh, a testament to Gary's abilities that he could come in from doing American martial arts pictures and pretty much hold his own with Jackie in this kind of film. Um, and then the, in, the battle interrupted by the arrival of uh, Donald Mack and his men in red. And... Uh, I love this bit, the, the kind of the comic back and forth between uh, Gary and Jackie. See, these are the kind of things that actually make uh, the distinct characteristics of a Jackie Chan action comedy is uh, the incidental stuff, the stuff that doesn't have a big build-up. And uh, Richard, uh, a favourite of Jackie's, he's worked with Jackie more times than any other Western actor, first in Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars, then again in City Hunter, and then most recently in Miss the Nice Guy, which was shot in on, on Richard's home turf in Melbourne. And again, you know, as I was talking before at Lewis Roth, one of the reasons that Richard is a re frequent returnee is because he's low maintenance. I think Jackie um, found him easy to work with. And uh, But when we were talking about Gary one time, and I think we're featuring this interview elsewhere on the DVD, um, Jackie said to me that he really liked Gary's techniques and he liked what Gary did in the film, and he just wished that the film had been played more serious and that they'd really had a serious fight, and that if he ever did A City Hunter 2, he'd like to direct it himself and really let Gary show what he could do and Jackie to do his thing. And unfortunately that hasn't happened, but uh, it may yet, because... Both of them are both um, fit and funky and, and still making films. And uh, no uh, Jackie movie will be complete without the three actresses in search of a brain. And uh, here we see the supporting cast trying to sneak around inconspicuously uh, through this ship. And this is actually uh, a set at Golden Harvest with everybody um, running around behind the back of Lo Wei Gong. And um, Lo Wei Gong obviously is an actor or man who's very confident of his own masculinity because in this movie he has the honour of playing a, an obviously gay terrorist. And in Crime Story, which is being shot at the same time, he gets to kiss Jackie full on the lips in a scene set in a bar. But uh, I think those of us who knew Ken at that time, I mean, he's happily married now, but at the time the film was made, know that uh, he was all man if we can say that. But uh, this was something that um, raised consternation when the film was going to be released in the States, that uh, the idea that you would portray um, this terrorist as an openly uh, gay character. Great reaction shot from that girl when she goes flying down the hall. She's a... Later went on to become... I think she was a penthouse model or something. She vanished. She wasn't in many other films. She just was in this one and vanished from the scene. And uh, here's Lo Wei Gong proving what team he bats for, which uh, is... This is the typical way that Wong Jing treats um, this particular sexual preference in his films. It's always always played for laughs. And uh, first time we really get to see that terrific flexibility that uh, Ken Lo has. And he was working as a doorman at a nightclub when Jackie discovered him. And... Uh, just liked not just his his ability because I mean Jackie meets all kinds of different martial arts experts, but his attitude because he's very polite and, and nice with people um, when he's not uh, I guess in the nightclub situation when he wasn't busy throwing them out he was very nice and polite to people and indeed still is he's very charming uh, especially given the kind of mean characters he plays uh, on screen he's very affable and charming off screen. Here's another sequence, this, the, the timing of this uh, moment coming up when they're doing the kind of the, uh, the kind of cha-cha, the hop-step cha-cha for the gun. Is, um, again, it's a sequence you probably only see in a Wong Jing movie. You only see in a Hong Kong movie and probably only in a Wong Jing Hong Kong movie. And uh, it's uh, nice timing, the fight between them, and uh, especially when you consider that none of them are actually martial artists apart from, of course, Lo Wei Gong is a martial artist. So... Nice way for the three girls to take him out. It's funny. I mean, I would have thought that 
Loewegon would actually become a bigger star in his own right. And there's been attempts to launch him in various vehicles. But um, I guess there's, uh, sometimes you have somebody who will work very well when they're cast opposite somebody like Jackie and, and just carry can't cannot uh, carry a film in their own right. And um, I guess in his case, that was, that was so. Though he has actually been more successful in a number of TV series. There's Ching Miao getting loaded for bear. And uh, one thing you could not accuse City Hunter of is a lack of colourful supporting characters. And they're all colour-coded as well, if you notice the colour schemes of red and white through the costumes and the, and the backdrop with the occasional dash of black, uh, like uh, prevalent throughout. And... Uh, Another nice Wong Jing gag of the uh, the soft hard kids. Um, this is a play on words because they were saying put on comfortable clothes and it could also mean like uh, nightwear. So uh, that's a kind of a, a gag that really only would work if you were a, a Cantonese speaker. And uh, so the gang go out to save the day and here's uh, Jackie's character facing the firing squad. And this is actually on the ship in the Sea of Japan. And one of the earliest scenes shot for the movie, uh, they shot all the scenes on the boat uh, early in the production before they came back to Hong Kong to shoot the interior stuff at Golden Harvest and Shaw Brothers. And he's making his last request, which is a bowl of noodles. So uh, he is, he's going to die a hungry man. And, uh, of course, nobody really believes that Jackie's going to get killed, but, I mean, everybody wants to uh, see how he gets out of jail quick. And... Uh, Here's his lady in white. And notice the colour scheme. It's really uh, uh, one of the better designed Hong Kong movies because even on the deck of the ship, everything fits into the, those, the, the palette of colours that's been defined for the, for the design. And Kamika Goto um, really uh, was not an experienced actress but uh, did a great job in the film. And she's saying her lines in Japanese. And this was a common thing in the days when... Uh, Hong Kong movies were shot wild. Jackie would be speaking Cantonese, uh, maybe a Japanese actress speaking Japanese, a Korean in Korean, uh, an American actor speaking English, all in the same shot. And they'd really have to follow each other's timing as to know when they could speak and uh, when they should stop. And here's uh, Wong Jing's reason why big busty girls should not carry big guns because they will, of course, be pulled off balance and fall forward onto the deck. Um, and this next shot coming up with uh, Jing Mi Yao, is, that's a movie poster waiting to happen. I mean, I really think this should have been uh, a movie in its own right. Her character here. And that, Gary told me when they were shooting on the deck, she, he was really impressed because she didn't uh, have any background as a stunt woman or a martial artist. But she was really just gung-ho. And she really fires that gun like she means it. Um, I, it's too bad she retired. She married a wealthy guy and quit the industry, which is you know, a common flight path for uh, women in the uh, actresses in, in Hong Kong. And there's uh, Vincent Laporte biting the dust. And, um, yeah, but going back to Ching Mi Yao, I really thought that her, her character here could, could actually stand a film on her own. It's like a lady city hunter. And the nearest thing was uh, Naked Killer. But I felt the Naked Killer, really, the, the ad campaign with her naked with all the bullets around her was really what appealed to everybody around the world. And the film, for a start, she never wears the outfit in the film, but also the film didn't really have a huge amount of um, martial arts or gunplay action in it as such, which is what people want to see. Lo Gong was in it, Ken Lo, who's also in this movie, and been in a bunch of Wong Jing films. And Mike Abbott's uh, great moment as he's uh, gunning for Jackie, and then uh, he's chasing after Kamiko Goto. And uh, earlier in the film, when Jackie's character, when uh, Manbo accepts the the job of finding Kumiko Goto, uh, he, we see film of, that her father shows him of her performing gymnastics. So that's kind of a bit of foreshadowing because now she has to use that skill to uh, stay one step ahead of this bad guy. And throughout this sequence, uh, for the more difficult gymnastic moves, she was actually doubled by a guy called Man Ching, who's a, uh, a veteran member of the Jackie Chan stunt team. And he's got a very slender build, so he makes a good double for, for women. So he was always being called on to double for girls. And uh, he did duty in, in this sequence, and I've seen these shots of, of him next to... Uh, still shots of him next to Kumiko Goto wearing the same outfit and uh, he's doing like the, the more dangerous gymnastic feats. Mike Abbott, not a martial artist, but uh, it's funny because he had the, pig, the ponytail so he and, uh, he and Gary kind of looked like a, a match set and, uh, except for the fact that Gary was kind of uh, had that super rugged cut physique and, and Mike's a little, little heavier set. 
But this is actually the most uh, action he's had to do in a film. I mean, he's normally a, a background heavy. But I, I see him sometimes at various events. He's still around town, still looks about the same as he does in this film. Um, and uh, there's a nice moment for, for Kamiko's character. And she was, like, called on to do about 30%, I think, and the, uh, the actual gymnastics is down to Manching, flying high. Actually shot on the, a real boat. All of this stuff is actually on the real cruise liner. And uh, so we go from here, and uh, the the payoff, the kind of the 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 knocking out of Mike Abbott's character is a real goes back to the glory days of uh, the Big Boss when you could actually knock a man through a wall as he's going, going, boom, and then down through the deck. And I always thought this was actually a great product placement. I don't know what brand of sunglasses they are. But uh, they could have actually taken that shot out and, and had a great sunglasses ad right there. Jackie, a big fan of big sunglasses. I mean, often on the set, he'll have sunglasses the same size, bigger than the ones Gary had on in that shot, which cover up half his face, which I think is just his way of shutting out the world for a while, uh, particularly if he's directing the movie at the same time. And uh, this helicopter sequence actually shot in uh, uh, off the shores of Hong Kong. Um, Jackie has such a great relationship with the police that um, w whenever he's shooting a movie, if he needs to borrow police equipment, such as helicopters and um, ab sailors and all these things, um, they really bend over backwards to help him. Ever since the first police story movie, he's been like the poster boy for the, the Hong Kong police. And so he can draft in units to come and help him out on all his films. So all this sequence shot exteriors uh, in the seas around Hong Kong and uh, a gunfight as the SWAT team want to take over the uh, the boat. And these guys are putting these demolition charges. And uh, normally I would think in a Hollywood movie, when you're going to blow up a set like this, you would actually have limited fire effect and a, a miniature with CG. But in Hong Kong, until very recently, there wasn't really any facility to do miniatures or to do uh, extensive CG, so it was all done for real. And here's uh, back at Golden Harvest Studios in the, the game room set, and the soft, hard kids getting kicked into touch. I was actually on the set when they were shooting the sequence, and um, it's like uh, uh, Gary's big scene in the movie. I think he was a bit disappointed that he didn't get to more, do more of like a one-on-one -on -one slugfest with Jackie. There he is doing the hungar raised finger position. He was heavily into his kung fu training then, as he is now. And then uh, a quick exchange of uh, techniques, and we're into fantasy land with... Uh, Jackie smashing himself into the computer game and going into this kind of delirium where he sees Jackie as the Ken character from the movie, from the game Street Fighter. Of course, later was a pretty bad film starring John claude Van Damme. And this sequence was choreographed entirely by uh, director Ching Su Dong, who's the king of wire work, who directed the Chinese ghost story films. Notice here when Jackie picks a character to fight back with, it's uh, Yi Hondae not Honda. Uh, the character's meant to be E Honda, but because of his contract with Mitsubishi, they didn't want to use the word Honda, so they altered the, uh, the character's name on the game. But going back to uh, Ching Su Dong, he was brought in because uh, there's no uh, very little CG work in this, I mean, apart from animation. And so every time the character's flying around, that's what you're seeing uh, it was really happening on the set and uh, I was actually there when they were putting people on wires and it's very painful to be spun in different directions on wires but this is all real, this is a guy actually going up and down off the ground on wires and people sometimes ask me to define the difference between uh, Hong Kong choreography and American film fight choreography and I think this scene is actually a, a good example apart from the wacky nature of the sequence but the fact that Hong Kong film fight choreographers, and Ching Su Dong particularly, seem to think in three dimensions, and they somehow have a, a sense uh, of how you could wire up a person or an object to fly for a specific amount of time in a specific direction. And um, they do it better than anybody else in the world. And uh, it's only recently that uh, Hollywood has kind of caught on to the fact that this technique even exists, and even at the time of speaking, if they want to do it well, they have to call on Hong Kong um, stunt directors to do it. 
And it's a whole different mindset because uh, in Hong Kong, we really kept the tricks, the trade secret. But in Hollywood, they're kind of proud of using wires. So you see all these uh, uh, behind the scenes documentaries of films like The Matrix and Romeo Must Die and Charlie's Angels showing where all the wires were, which I don't think anyone's ever done in Hong Kong. We kind of like, I wouldn't say people were ashamed, but they didn't want to reveal the tricks of the trade. They wanted people not to know how it was done. And um, this was amazing to watch because it actually was shot in real time with real people spinning around and uh, pretty painful. I mean, probably as painful as any kind of martial arts scene shot for a film. Jackie in drag, which is something he's done um, a few times before and seems to have fun with. I mean, uh, the movie Project S with Michelle Yeoh is a good example. When I think he's only in drag in that movie, we never see him out of a, out of a dress. And uh, it's a great sequence. And you know what? I have to say that uh, Ching Su Dong packed more of the real Street Fighter energy into this short scene than uh, there was in the whole of the Van Damme film of the same name. Wong Jing, obviously a big fan of uh, video game characters because he recently made a movie in the name of Heroes, which uh, uses all the characters from the video game Tekken. And uh, that's coming out uh, later this year. So... Um, it's obviously a, a, an inspiration for him in terms of uh, action movie characters. The, um, this sequence here was actually shot at another set at uh, Golden Harvest and not on the boat itself, with uh, Leon Lai getting his uh, chance to shine. And uh, it's only a Hong Kong movie, I think, where you could realistically believe that a set of playing cards is a realistic weapon to use against four terrorists armed with uh, automatic weapons. And this character of the uh, the god of gamblers, the the martial arts master, card sharp, gambling expert, dates back to the Shaw Brothers era, and is like, uh, or before that, is really a recurring character in Hong Kong action films. Because um, it has to be said that you know one of the major Chinese pastimes is uh, is gambling in various forms, uh, which is interesting because in Hong Kong, gambling is actually illegal. So if people do want to gamble, often they take boats, like the one seen in this film. And the boats sail out into uh, outside of Hong Kong's territorial waters where it is legal for people to gamble. And they actually just gamble on the casino ships, which then return to port the following day. So um, the concept for this film is, is legitimate. This is actually is a way that gambling happens. Now, at Macau, which is the Portuguese enclave which neighbors Hong Kong, gambling is legal. And uh, one of the major sources of revenue for the, the Macanese government is uh, gambling in the casinos there. So, um, but despite the fact that gambling is illegal in Hong Kong, uh, people are still fascinated with it. Most of the gambling they do is, is gambling on horses. But uh, they, uh, they're fascinated by card games, and so uh, this is like a, a, a recurring theme, particularly Wong Jing has made a career out of turning people into card sharp heroes, and he created the character of that Jay, in fact, played in God of Gamblers and then had a, even more success um, at the box office with a comedy take on God of Gamblers when he introduced Chao Xingqi as the saint of gamblers. Chao in fact, was the Dou San, which is the God of Gamblers, and Chao Xingqi was Dou Xing, which is saint of gamblers. And uh, there you have the little romantic uh, aspect, the relationship between these two characters. And uh, meanwhile... Back at Shaw Brothers, on the on the big set, we see um, Donald Mac's plans going awry. As uh, now you see why they had the stuntmen in the masks because they're going to blow all hell out of this set. And um, when they do blow a set in Hong Kong, they blow it. I mean, uh, they actually it was charged, rigged, stuntmen flying in every direction. And basically, after they'd finished blowing it up, they came back in, and that was the set that uh, they filmed on for the finale. Now, this scene here, even though this is a comedy movie and a light-hearted Jackie movie, this is actually one of the most dangerous scenes he's done. What happens here is there's a, a technician off-camera obviously running an uh, electrode over a, a series of relay charges, and as they hit each relay charge, then the, the relevant explosion goes off behind Jackie. But if he trips or if the guy gets ahead of himself or misses a cue then it's kind of uh, stir-fried Jackie. So this is probably one of the most dangerous stunts Jackie's ever done, ending with this dive down, down, boom, safe landing. But that's a hell of a stunt. We, we kind of, like, re recreated a little bit of that for Jackie Chan, my stunts. And now he's coming in for the... This is back at Shaw Brothers, and uh, 
There was actually, when I was on the set, uh, I, I don't know, maybe in Hollywood they would have a machine, but when I was on the set, there was actually a guy up there doing the sparks. And this poor bugger, he had to actually sit up there hour after hour while they were doing multiple takes of multiple scenes. And he'd be showering sparks because that was uh, how the scene was meant to look. And uh, I was impressed by the fact that in Hong Kong, you know, you would actually just get somebody to do that. Now, for this sequence, it's actually uh, the same girl uh, is used in this scene as was used in a later Jackie Chan movie called Gorgeous, where he's spinning Brad Allen around uh, his body. And uh, she's a local dancer, and uh, she's very good at uh, doing this kind of gymnastic style. So she was brought in to double for Ching Miao for these moves. And uh, it's not, I mean, I, 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 this, this kind of stuff is just so far out there. But uh, I guess it's what makes these movies different from, from the kind of action movies made in the States. And uh, kind of fun to see. I remember a movie called uh, Al vs. Dumbo, where Sam Hong does a whole soft shoe dance routine halfway through, which is like, uh, is a lot of fun. And uh, Ching Miao, I mean, uh, one thing about her, even though she was, you know, dressed up as the femme fatale, she really uh, plays it to the hilt, which... Um, You've got to give her credit for because, I mean, she, she looks good with a gun. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, it's too bad she didn't get more serious roles uh, or semi-serious roles where she got to be the action lead in a film because I think she could, she could carry it. Uh, I know Wong Jing wanted to bring her back for Naked Killer 2000, but she'd retired by then. Look at the state of this guy, stuck on the wall. <laughs> and uh, that's, a, that's a, a Wong Jing-style effect, somebody beaten up to that extent. Nice gunplay there. That spinning in the air shot. And then uh, uh, poor uh, Joey taking another dive into the pit. And some acrobatic gunplay as uh, Jackie keeps the gun in the air. Nice reaction shot from, Je from, from Richard. Boom, the trigger's gone. And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a... Uh, it's interesting the way that they deal with gunplay in this movie because... I mean, if you look at it realistically, the age of semi-automatic weaponry should mean the end of martial arts movies because if everybody has guns that fire bullets at these horrific rates, why would anybody stand and duke it out, you know, fist to fist or stick to sword or nunchaku to nunchaku? So um, filmmakers always have to find an imaginative way to get around the question of gunplay um, to make the fights work. So here's a kind of... Here's their take on it here, and it's, it's quite nicely handled. And a quick moment for Richard to show his, his style. He's really one of the toughest-looking fighters, Richard. I mean, you really think if he really hit somebody, he really would connect. And uh, Jackie really kind of counterbalanced that with his acrobatic style. I love the way uh, Richard takes his jacket off now. This actually took a whole bunch of takes to get it down. My God, it's worth it. Look at that. So uh, they say Yao Ying, very stylish. And uh, the next scene, it's Jackie using the iron arm technique. And uh, it's, just, it's just so much fun because, I mean, it plays back to the old movies when these guys had, like, the iron bell. But, of course, Jackie doesn't really have the iron bell. And it, the CGI, CGI tears coming out <laughs> as uh, it's Richard on the attack. And uh, it's, it's typical of the way Hong Kong movies are made because Richard's an expert in almost every kind of weapon. Um, from Okinawa, the sai, the bow, the kama, the katana, everything. But the one area that he's not familiar with is probably Filipino stick work. So the weapon that they decided to have him use in this film was double sticks. So he was trying to have to improvise the uh, Filipino stick fighting style. But that's one of the things about Richard, that he's always learning new stuff. I mean, in, recently he's been training the Brazilian jiu-jitsu, like a lot of his contemporaries, um, like Chuck Norris, who's a, a very close and good friend of, uh, of Richard's. So even, even though he's already an established master in the martial arts and a black belt several times over, he's always learning new stuff. And um, Richard won't mind me saying this because I think he refers to himself in the interview appearing elsewhere on this DVD, but um, because of the time involved um, and the, the amount of work they needed to get done, for some of the uh, more complicated sequences and different sequences of the stick work, he was doubled by Mars by Four Singh, who is a veteran Jackie Chan stunt member, stunt team member, and was the co-star of Jackie's film Dragon Lord. But I really have to say that um, yeah, Mars looks about as much like Richard uh, as I look like Brad Pitt. 
And uh, so I, I, you kind of have to uh, bear with the fact that uh, some of the time you see Richard doing his thing as of now, and some of the times it's um, Mars with a really bad hair dye job. So, uh, but Richard, unlike some people, is very open about saying, yes, they use the double. And uh, it's common in Hong Kong action films that basically everybody uses a double uh, at various times during the shooting of a film, um, some people more than others. But uh, in this instance, um, it was more due to constraints of time than the fact that, uh, that Richard couldn't handle the moves because actually the movements themselves are quite basic. It's just the timing back and forward. And the weapon Jackie's using here, which was established earlier in the film as the weapon of choice of the security guards, is the, the tonfa, or these the short crutches. And uh, I rather think it's um, Spiritual Kung Fu, one of his earlier Law Wei films. He has a fight using this weapon. Um, Jackie now, of course, he very rarely uses traditional Kung Fu or traditional Kung Fu weapons in his movies. But I was very impressed when he, we were doing the documentary, Jackie Chan, My Stunts, how his... Traditional kung fu skill and his ability, particularly with weapons, was really impressive. But I guess he feels he's already been there and done that, so he doesn't have to do it anymore. And uh, Richard giving uh, Jackie a, a good whipping. And uh, this is probably Wong Jing's idea after one long, hard shoot. But uh, it's amazing when you think of the number of years and the number of films that Jackie's been doing, that they can still come up with inventive stuff like this, that scenes that you haven't seen before. Um, and uh, I know when they shot this movie and uh, Richard was um, initially, because he was aware of you know, quite how punishing Hong Kong movies are, didn't jump at the chance to come and do City Hunter. And they, he got uh, offered a decent deal, you know, considering his position in the industry, um, to come and work on the film. And I think they went over time and uh, the studio were basically saying, oh, would you stay on for free <laughs> or for less money? He was like, no, no, you just take your time. You just pay me what you promised me and, and, and that'll be fine. So he did well out of the fact that the movie, this long sequence, took longer to shoot. He was in Hong Kong for longer than expected. And uh, as you can see, he worked hard and, and he earned every dime of what they gave him. But I'm, you know, I'm sorry to say this is true. Hong Kong companies in the past have tended to play fast and loose with the way they treat the overseas talent. Jackie with a pole in his hand for the first time since, uh, what, Young Master? I don't know. It's been a while. Uh, it was a while before City Hunter was made. He, he'd kind of moved away from doing anything resembling traditional martial arts. So we get a reference to it here as he's, uh, as he's uh, showing some nice pole movements here. And uh, it's... Uh, you know, you really get a flavour of the fact that he was one of the best guys for using weapons. And I think part of this comes from the Peking Opera background because the opera, unlike like the classical Italian opera, where people are basically static, the, Italian, the, the, the Peking Opera, there's always movement on the stage and people relating with spears and sticks and, and other implements being spun back and forward with really amazing timing and dexterity. And Jackie was learning this at such a young age that uh, he could never forget it. So now Richard's about to make his great farewell. Look at that. What a, what a, what a great character. And uh, it was when I was watching this movie again uh, in preparation for doing the commentary that I appreciated you know, how much fun Richard had with it and how much fun he is to watch. Um, and it, I wish I, all you producers out there give Richard Norton more comedy roles because he's actually a very funny man. But I guess because you know, he's built like... Uh, you know, uh, an, an action hero. He gets cast in straight man leads more often than not, or as bad guys, one or the other. But actually, he, he could play in comedies very well. He was just in a movie, Amazons and Gladiators, which did very well at the American film market. And uh, he's um, Jackie now torn between which of the, the damsel in distress he needs to save, whether it's Jing Miao or, or Joey Wong. And she took so much abuse in this film, poor girl. And there we are. Now, this, of course, was shot earlier uh, on the actual deck of the ship out in the Sea of Japan. And uh, so this is like months earlier. The last scene was at Shaw Brothers. And here we are with uh, the, the payoff and uh, Jackie fulfilling, Manbor fulfilling his mission, which is to recover the rich, girl's daughter, the rich man's daughter, the poor little rich girl played by Kumiko Goto. And uh, this is actually would have been a good final shot for the film. But they landed in Japan, and, and Jackie wanted to have a more extended payoff. So we go from this nice pullback from the, uh, this magnificent gambling ship to an interior actually in Hong Kong, and uh, the grateful thanks of uh, 
the Kumiko Goto's father, who's uh, obviously a Japanese multi-millionaire. She had an amazing tan. I've noticed that. It's kind of Hong Kong girls want to stay paler than pale, but Japanese girls love to get a tan. And Kumiko Goto certainly had a very impressive tan. I guess she was up on the deck um, every spare moment. And there's... Uh, uh, she just walked out of frame, but she comes back again later. The lovely Cordelia Choi, my old mate, who uh, plays the boss's secretary in this film. So this interior actually was shot in uh, a building in Central in Hong Kong. And uh, even though the exteriors setting up to it are, are in Japan. And Jackie being offered the daughter in marriage and uh, turning the deal down. He's, um, Jackie's one of the very few Hong Kong action stars who's really broken into the Japanese market. They're very selective, uh, the Japanese audience, about who they accept from the, the Hong Kong entertainment world. Um, Teresa Tang, who was the, a singer, passed away a few years ago, was a big star in Japan. And Jet Li was huge um, after the first Shaolin Temple movie and from there on out. He's had a big Japanese following. Now, this is the payoff. They call this uh, the dessert. When they're shooting a Hong Kong movie, they say these kind of uh, play-out scenes at the end of the dessert of the film. So uh, this is the finale and uh, setting up Manbo for other missions in the future. Though this was actually the only City Hunter film to star Jackie. And there's the lovely Cordelia. And uh, as I mentioned at the start when she appeared, she, was in, uh, she dies a horrible death in Purple Storm which was a movie produced by a company that I used to work for called Media Asia. So I should apologise to her. And there's a little in-joke here when Jackie uh, recognises her as being pretty, comes back and says, um, uh, where's she gone, comes back, what's your name? And she says, my name's Choi. And her real name is Choi. So there she gets a name check. Now we're in Japan. Um, the, the, scene, the previous scene was actually shot in interior in Hong Kong. And now in Japan, and uh, Jackie looking fore and aft for his next Mitsubishi car pulls out a handy gadget and uh, sees Joey Wong stalking away. They actually docked the ship in um, Japan and came ashore to shoot this brief sequence in which um, the big hammer gets out of the fantasy world and into reality. They had to find a way to get it in there somewhere. I mean, this sounds bizarre, but actually that uh, £1,000 hammer was a, a key ingredient of the original cartoon show. So um, that Kaori, the character that uh, is played here by Joey Wong, was always chasing Man Bo wielding this massive hammer. So they had to somehow include it. And there's a very funky-looking uh, Mitsubishi with a, a kind of like sideways DeLorean-style doors opening. And uh, Jackie, as always, surrounds himself with a pretty high babe factor for the movie. Ching Miao, uh, a Wong Jing favourite, and she was in most of his movies of this era. And here comes the hammer. Boom! And into the the finale and... Uh, Jackie, the, the man bore dream sequence. And this is, this is another carry-on from the, the cartoon and um, an aspect of the character that, that he's always, like, chasing girls. So we'd go from here to dissolve from Jackie into the freeze frame and then some of the original manga cartoon artwork of uh, the man bore character and into the famous outtakes. Jackie looking very fetching in drag and uh, right down to the rubber. And there's the, the dancer doing uh, doubling for Ching Miao and the shirtless Lo Wei Gong stepping into frame. What a burly fellow. And Jackie getting bitten by the rat. A real rat. There are no stunt rats. That's Ji Suk there, Uncle Ji, our stunt guy in Gen X Cops and Gen Y Cops. He's really young. I don't know why they call him... Uh, he looks young. I don't know why they call him Uncle. Uh, Suk means uncle. They call him Uncle Ji. And no one's been able to say why. Joey Wong not being able to keep a straight face with Jackie. And... Uh, you know, you can see... Sometimes you can tell from the outtakes whether a film was kind of fun to make or not, and uh, this evidently was. The outtake's a little longer on, this, on the Japanese print of City Hunter. And Jackie's actually uh, uh, singing the City Hunter song, though there's another... There's two versions of the film, one with a Japanese song playing over the end credits. Oh, there's Michael Wong, breathing his last. Michael has such a great voice. Uh, and... Uh, in a film called Manhattan Midnight, you should check out. It's a cool film. She just shot in English in, uh, in New York. Jackie uh, suffering for his art. I was on the set for some of this. And uh, there's, there's Mars doubling for Richard, as we talked about during the commentary. And uh, Jackie taking it like a man. He, he really does take a lot of punishment in the films. And he gets mad at himself. I mean, he, he, he's patient with other people. Um, 
particularly foreigners doing action in his films. But with himself, he's very impatient and uh, he gets very mad if he doesn't get stuff in the first few takes. And uh, that's, you know, something when you consider the fact that uh, he's... Um, He's been doing this for a long time now, so you'd, if anybody could be complacent, it would be him, but he definitely is not. There he's being pulled back from the, the famous flying dog. There's Jisook again on the left. See, look how young he looks. Yeah, Why would they call him Jisook? I don't know. Richard going for it. It's great. And you know what's good? You look at that. You see Richard, um, his, his face, he's like acting that you know he's in action. And the worst thing is when you're thinking about the moves and your face has no expression, and uh, that's always a problem when they bring people to do martial arts movies. Even, even well-known martial arts people from America, to act and, and, and fight at the same time is no easy feat. And uh, we're coming to the end, so this is me, Bay Logan, uh, signing off. Uh, I want to thank uh, all the good people at Medusa, uh, David and Brian and the gang, for giving me this opportunity to look at City Hunter and uh, watch it with you guys. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have, and I uh, look forward to talking to you, maybe meeting some of you. So sayonara, adios, joy again.